أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الممتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening and the return of our Imam Please recite the salawat I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity of once again having this opportunity of coming to the month of Muharram, commemorating the Shahada of Abu Abdullah al Hussein salawatullahi alayhi. It is a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has given us and he has allowed us to be here together, come together, join together for this commemoration which as the ahadith say when the believers gather together in order to remember Imam al Hussein, the angels are wishing that they are here when they hear about the rewards and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses this session such that they come afterwards and they put their wings and they try to get a little of the blessing that remains in the location that held those who remember Imam al Hussein. It's a great blessing. And many of the believers who were here last year or in other programs commemorating. The Shahada of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, some of them are not around. On your own, I don't want to take the time of this session, but in your heart, recite Surah Al Fatiha for them, remember them. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grant some of the rewards of this session to them, inshaAllah. One thing that I'd like to say, and we usually talk about this at the beginning of the season of Muharram is to remind ourselves of what we should be looking to get from this month. What are we supposed to be doing? What is the important features or what are the important features of this month? How can we make the best of it? Very briefly, there are two areas that we have got to try to benefit from this blessed month. And we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq, the ability to do that. One is to build a stronger emotional relationship with Abu Abdullah al Hussein. It's, it may be the case that when they say with regards to Imam al Hussein that he is safinatun najat, I've heard this said by the ulama. See, all of the Ahlul Bayt are Safinatun Najat. Every single one of them. It's not like one of the Imams is the Ark of Salvation and the others are not. They are all trying to save us. They are all Hablullah al Mateen. They are all lanterns of guidance. Masabihul Huda. However, there's something about Imam al Hussein that they say the arc of Imam al Hussein is, in a sense, a shorter route or takes a shorter right route to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe that is, as some of the ulama have stated this, it's 
It's because of the emotional attachment that is easier to have with Abu Abdullah al Hussein as compared to the rest of the Imams. You can't hear the story of Karbala. You have to be really rock solid and have a heart of stone to be able to hear the brutalities that occurred in the plains of Karbala and not shed tears. I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala softens my heart. Sometimes that heart becomes truly rock solid. We hear the stories, tears don't come. We ask Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we ask Abu Abdullah al Hussein to grant us, inshallah. So, one thing is to try to build an emotional relationship with Imam al Hussein. It's inshallah there, inshallah, we have a bit of that, we have the love. But we need to increase that. We need to have more of it. As we were mentioning at a different session last night, there are those that they just hear the name of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, they can't control their tears. This is what we should try to become. They hear the name of Sahib al Zaman, the Imam of our time, Ajjalallah Ta'ala Farajah al Sharif, they can't control their tears. They begin Dua al Nudba and they can't control their tears. At the beginning of Dua al Nudba, you're just asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're, we're thanking Him, we're praising Him, Alhamdulillah. That's what it starts with. There's nothing to cry about, but just knowing what this is about, what we are beginning to do. That feeling, being in that state, makes them cry. They see the pictures of Karbala, they cry. They say, Imam Zainul Abidin, salamullah alayhi, just this very, very brief remembrance of Karbala. They would bring water to him, he would shed tears, he would cry. Remembering the thirst of Karbala, the children not having water. Abu Abdullah al Hussein not having one. Just remembering that, shedding tears. We've got to try to build that emotional relationship. It's something that is especially needed out here, brothers and sisters. For various reasons, even many of the believers, the Shia, those who even come from an Eastern background, because on a general note, Eastern culture has a bit more emotions and the display of that. And the Western culture has a bit less when it comes to that. But even those of us who come from an Eastern background, their parents are from the East, we see that there's a lot less emotional attachment towards the Ahlul Bayt as compared to the centers of the Shia, be it Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, elsewhere, Lebanon, wherever, in the East. There's a lot less of that. So we have got to try to build that. So that's one thing. The other thing that we have to do, each of us individually, and these sessions at night are part of this, and I hope we go and we try to build more on our own, individually. And that is to gain more knowledge, more understanding. We've got to understand what the movement of the Imam is all about. We have got to try to study every single statement of the Imam. We have to study the timeline and the sequence of events from the beginning of the movement, even prior to it, in Rajab, when the Imam went from, Mecca, from Medina to Mecca and after that from there towards Kufa and when he changed course towards Karbala, we have to understand what was the Imam trying to do, what each statement meant, how this fits in that context, why did this Imam do this, previous Imams did other things, they took, they had a different stance on what was going on around them, why Amirul Mu'mineen had two phases in his life where initially he didn't take a stance against the Khulafa. Later on he took government 
and after he took office, then he fought those who fought him. He even went to fight those who challenged his government. Why? There's a difference we have to understand. Why Imam Zainul Abidin didn't stand against Yazid the way Abu Abdullah al Hussein did in the last few years of Yazid's life? After that, the other Khulafa, the Imams, what happened? Did the Imams suddenly decide that they're going to remain silent? Did the Imam suddenly, Al Ayadu Billah, forget what Imam al Hussein was calling upon when he said, do you not see that ma'roof and what the teachings of the divine are are not being implemented in munkar wrong is happening and is being done and no one's speaking against it imam zain al-abidin forgot about this imam al-baqir imam al-sadiq none of them what happened we got to study this we have to understand we have to increase the knowledge. So these are two areas that we're going to have to focus on. And hopefully these sessions will help that. But I insist, brothers and sisters, this is not something that you're going to be able to gain through just coming to lectures. You're going to have to follow it up. You have to put more effort into it. You have to read. And I know it's difficult. There's not many resources out there. But it's our struggle, brothers and sisters. We have got to try to put in an effort, create literature. Try to do whatever we can in our ability to try to increase the literature that's out there. It's very minimal. There's many books that haven't been translated, many books that could be written. We have to see what part of that we can play, inshallah. Recite a salawat, please. What do we want to do over the course of these 10 nights in these short talks and speeches that we have? What I've tried to title it, the theme, what connects all of the topics over the course of these 10 nights is the well-known, hopefully to many of us, if not all of us, slogan that was pronounced after the shahada of Imam al Hussein, according to the ahadith initially by the angels. Then we were taught some of the Shia in a sense of the Ahlul Bayt that went out with Mukhtar started chanting that, the Tawabin started chanting it. It is something that you'll find the traces of in Ziyarat Ashura and also in Dua and Nudbah but not exactly in this way, phrased in this way, but in other ways, the same concept is put forth. And that is, Ya Latharat al Hussein. Okay. This is an important slogan. The hadith says that the angels, when they came to know of what is transpiring in Karbala, they wanted to go and help Abu Abdullah al Hussein. According to the hadith, when we're talking about supernatural beings when we are talking about angels when we are talking about the unseen the description of it is usually somewhat symbolic in other words it shouldn't be taken at face value I will express what the hadith says but please don't take it at face value it says that they came they got there late they arrived there late that has a meaning which I don't want to get into it says they arrived there late and they saw Abu Abdullah al-Hussein has already been martyred. And what they started to do is that they started chanting the slogan, Ya Latharat al-Hussein. And they will keep doing that until the, t the day that this actually materializes. What does this mean? Sometimes, Thar, we have that in Ziyarat Ashura, it was just recited beautifully. We call Abu Abdullah al-Hussein Tharullah. Okay. Ever wonder what that means? I don't know what exactly it's been translated. I haven't seen the, the English translations of Mafatihul Janan or other dua books that have tried to translate this. In some of the languages, including in Farsi, sometimes they translate that as the blood of God. Okay. Tharullah, they translate Thar as blood. That's not a very accurate translation. What it means is 
thought of a person is the person or the people who were trying to take revenge for an oppression that has taken place upon someone that they, I, they have some form of relationship with. Okay. So if I were to be chanting or if I would want to stand and rise up and to try to take revenge against the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, the enemies of Imam al Hussein, those who created the atrocities in Karbala that we know, and I would want to try to go against them, bring them to justice, I would be the Thar of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Sometimes, instead of saying that a person is the Thar of, let's say, Imam al Hussein, they say, Tharullah, for example, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that will be taking revenge for Imam al Hussein. So we have this in Ziyarat Ashura. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that's going to be taking revenge for Imam al Hussein. What happened to Imam al Hussein? But whenever we attribute anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is thought, or you say Imam al Hussein is Tharullah, in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be taking revenge, that doesn't mean, as we've seen in history, that somehow supernaturally some angel is sent and sets, let's say, Yazid on fire. Doesn't happen like that. He doesn't send an angel to set Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad on fire, for example, or to bring him to, in, to justice in one way or the other. Many times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he does things, he does it through the believers. We have this in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he punishes the disbelievers with the hands of the believers, with the authority and the power of the believers. So thought Allah didn't mean and doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to supernaturally take revenge. It means through the believers. This is important. We're going to see how that's going to be very important. So this is a slogan that is chanted. We say this with regards to, as we say in Ziyarat al-Shura, we say Imam al Hussein is Tharullah. We explain what that means. Also in that ziyarah, what we ask him is, we say, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say in a couple of passages of the ziyarah, وَأَنْ يَرْزُقَنِي طَلَبَ ثَارِكَ مَعَ إِمَامٍ مَنْصُورٍ okay. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this passage, Oh Allah, and we're addressing Imam al Hussein. Say, we ask Allah, addressing Imam Hussein, we ask Allah that He give us the blessing of being able to be of those who will be seeking revenge of yours, Ma'a Imamin Mansur, with the Imam that will be receiving divine help and support, the Imam of our time, Ajal Allah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. Okay. So we ask, we're asking in this ziyarah, Ya Allah, I want to be of those that seek to revenge the blood of Imam al Hussein. This is important. What does this mean? We are taught this to repeat this. The hadith of ziyarat Ashura tells us that it is very much recommended to recite ziyarat Ashura on a daily basis. It's called Ziyarat Ashura because the hadith, the person is asking, what should we do on the day of Ashura? And the Imam instructs him to say what we say in Ziyarat Ashura. That's why it's called Ziyarat Ashura. But at the end of the hadith, the Imam says, it doesn't matter if you're in Karbala or you're elsewhere. If it's on the day of Ashura or at some other time, it is recommended to recite this Ziyarat. And there's many benefits and blessings that come with that. I don't want to get into that. But the important thing that I'm trying to draw from this is that we are told to recite this on a daily basis. Okay. 
So we have got to consider ourselves to be someone who was working on seeking revenge for what happened to Imam al Hussein. Is this an exaggeration? It is, is this symbolic? Does this have a meaning that is somehow supernatural? Or are we just told to say this, but not really do anything about it? We're just supposed to say these words. What I have studied and found with regards to our du'as, any du'a that we make, is that the du'a, the verbal request, the statement that is made, the words that are uttered, when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, they have got to be followed by some form of action to be considered a real du'a. If you just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, send me cash, and you don't want to work. It doesn't work like that. You ask and you work. That's the only way you're going to get it. You don't ask for good grades on your exams and just ask and not study for it. You do that, you're going to flunk the test. You have to ask and do what your responsibility is, go study. For everything it is like that, that's what dua actually means. If it's just words that are uttered and we don't understand what we're saying, like many times when we read these du'as of the Ahlul Bayt, these great du'as that we're not even familiar with many of them, in Sahifa Sajjadiyya, or the ones we are familiar with, we have no clue what they actually mean. When we read du'a al-Kumayl, we don't understand what we're asking for and that's why we don't move towards it. We don't take action. That's what the purpose of all of these du'as is. It's to teach us what to move towards. What to want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then start taking step towards it. So this du'a is for a reason. We have got to consider ourselves part of something. And it's something really, really big. Without any joke. Okay, without This is very serious. It's important. Recite a salawat, please. One of the things that as a human being, we are in need of, is to belong to a group. All right. Everybody wants to be accepted as part of something, some group, some activity. You don't want to be alone, all right? It's always like that. It's always been like that. And the important thing is to try to be part of the, the right movement, okay? Part of the right group of people. It's interesting to know that in a sense, originally, the word Shia actually meant that. I don't know if you've seen, sometimes they translate the word Shia to be the party of. Shia to Ali ibn Abi Talib, salamullah alayh. At least at a time, meant the party of Amirul Mu'mineen. Okay. In other words, his groupies, people that were in love with him, were around him, were always following him, always looking up to him, not just in a spiritual way, not just loving him from a distance, but actually they were always with Amirul Mu'mineen Salamullah After the Imam, they were with Imam al mujtaba Afterwards, like Habib ibn Madahir, who was one of the remainders and one of the ones who was left behind from the Shia of Amir al Mu'mineen in Kufa, they're with Imam al Hussein. They're the, the party, the Hizb of Imam al Hussein or Amir al Mu'mineen. 
the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, when you word it like that, it just maybe it doesn't, it doesn't carry the same weight, it doesn't give it the same weight. We are supposed to be the party of the Ahlul Bayt. In other words, a party means that it's a group of people which have the same objective. They're trying to accomplish a common objective, a common goal. That's the definition of a party. Otherwise, it's just individuals. Okay. What brings them together is the accomplishment of a particular objective, goal. This is what we're supposed to be. When we're chanting, Ya Latharat al Hussein, as we have been taught in these du'as, ziyarat, whether it's du'a nudba or ziyarat ashura, or the ahadith teach us, we are saying that we want to be part of the party of the Ahlul Bayt that has an objective which is somehow put forth in, in this statement after the movement of Imam al Hussein. Ya Latharat al Hussein. We are trying to seek revenge. We are a group. Then there are people that are not only not part of this, because people who are not part of this hizb, but part of this group, part of this organization, if we can call it that, they vary. Some people are just kind of lost. They're careless. They just go with whatever happens. Uthman was in power. They were there. They were fine. They were living their lives. Prior to Uthman, the Khalifa Umar was in power. They were okay. They didn't have any trouble. Afterwards, Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullah alayhi came to power. They were still okay. They didn't have any problems with anyone. These are some, some people. Then you have another group of people that are not only not with this hizb, with this party, but they are against this party. They are the enemies when you say, Ya Latharat al Hussein, if we are talking about the particular individuals that created the atrocities in Karbala, and we're trying to seek revenge of them, that's already done. I don't know how many of you have watched the movie that was made in Iran that kind of shows this it was called Mukhtar Nama about Mukhtar al thaqafi and how he brought some of those people in a sense to justice and what happened to many of those people that were there and others who didn't die in that way but they're already gone if we're talking about people in history what does that slogan translate to? What does that actually mean? We want to go back to history, pull people from their graves and do what the Salafis are doing with the body of Hurj ibn Adi? Is this what we want to do? We want to go dig up the body of Yazid and bring him to justice? Is this the meaning of Ya Latharat al Hussein? Definitely not. Is the sole purpose of the coming of the Imam of our time, Ajallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, to come, recite a proper salawat. To come and just pull some people out of the grave and bring them to justice? We're just upset about some part of history and we're trying to find some way of getting back at them and watch them suffer. That's it. I, I, I cannot accept that. This is not the Ahlul Bayt for me. I don't know about you guys. This is not the purpose of the coming of our Imam. What this means is that there's an ongoing battle between Haq and Batil an ongoing battle between the party of the Ahlul Bayt, the Hizb of the Ahlul Bayt, and their enemies. And we are part of this group. We want to be part of this movement. And it's ongoing. We're trying to accomplish the goal of the Ahlul Bayt. Recite a salawat, please.
So over the course of these nights, what we want to try to do is try to, try to understand what this actually means. What is the goal of the Ahlul Bayt? What's their objective? What were they trying to accomplish? And to a certain extent, starting to develop somewhat of an understanding with regards to how we can do this. Because there's a lot of confusion. Too much. There's a lot of confusion with regards to who is on our side. Who is on the other side? How do we take stances? What are our strategies? And many, many other areas that we have doubts and questions. Sometimes we don't even think of it, unfortunately. I want to try to do this over the course of these nights. One of the things that we have found in history, one of the things we need to learn, one of the initial steps of this process. Throughout history, at least the history of the Holy Prophet and the Imams, one of the problems that has existed is identifying who is actually the party that we are against. And there's been a lot of misunderstandings, which even today we have that. Amongst Muslims, one of the serious problems that we have is identifying who is it that is actually against us. We don't like to be against anybody. We would like everybody to be on the right path, everybody to do the right thing, and for there not to be any evil. But the problem is, when you want to do the right thing, there are certain people that are against you. They want to be against you. But who is it that's actually against the party of the Ahlul Bayt? Who is it that is against the party of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Holy Quran. God Almighty mentions in the Holy Quran. Who is it that is within this party? Who is it that is at least close to us? And who are the ones that are actually against? We have a problem with this. Some of the Muslims consider the Shia to be the enemies. They consider the Shia to be those who are against the Hizb of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they slaughtered them. You've seen the images in Syria. That's how they think it is. That's what they've been taught. The Shia. Why? Because of some of the things that have been said. Because of some of the things that the Ahlul Bayt have not taught us to do. And some of the Shia have done and are doing against the will of the Ahlul Bayt. And they say, oh, see, this is what we told you. The Shia are against the companions of the Holy Prophet. The Shia are not true believers in the Holy Prophet because they're against the companions of the Holy Prophet. They're against the wives of the Holy Prophet. They disrespect the wives of the Holy Prophet. Where did the Ahlul Bayt teach us to do this? Partially, I don't want to... Be put all blame on those who are doing this? No. That's not, that's not the case. There are the shayateen who come and spread mischief and evil and misinformation of the teachings of the Holy Prophet and they portray, portray this, the Shia as the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're willing to come and kill the Shia. On the other hand, the Shia consider some of the other sects within Islam to be the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. This is how the scene is put. Historically, we've had this issue. I'll give 
a couple of examples during the time of Amir al muminin When the battles took place, Amir al muminin fought three battles that hopefully if we get time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a life to live. Amir al muminin fought three difficult battles. One of them was the battle of Safin. Okay. I want to use two examples from this battle, the particular battle of Safin. One is for those who came and fought against Amir al Mu'minin, Salawatullah Ali. Our understanding, our impression, brothers and sisters, is that those who came and fought Amir al Mu'minin, whether it was the battle of Jamal, or the battle of Safin, or the battle of Nahrawan, the three battles that the Imam fought, they were people that were so evil, so terrible, that they actually had a serious problem with the Imam himself. These are people that are the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. And somehow they're either born like that or somehow they've turned into the greatest enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. When we look at history, whether it's understanding what happened in Sham that brought these people to the area referred to as a Safin where the battle took place, or it is looking at the way Amir al-Mu'mineen fought that battle itself, we realize that this is not a very accurate understanding. It's not. How is that? Brothers and sisters, whether it was the, uh, this battle of Safin or some of the battles that were fought later on, the people in Sham were Muslims. They loved the Holy Prophet. They really did. A lot of you are thinking, what's this crazy sheikh saying? These people loved the Holy Prophet. Yes, they did. They prayed. They were very serious about their prayer. They had companions of the Holy Prophet there on their side. Did you know that? Companions of the Holy Prophet. When you look at the way Muawiyah brought these people to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib salamullah alayhi wa ruhi lahu al-fida, you, you see that they were tricked. This is the reason why I'm mentioning this as an example. The same way that some of the other sects today are tricked into thinking that the Shia are the enemies. They were tricked. And Muawiyah played it very, very cleverly he brought one of the companions of the Holy Prophet and played a trick on him for him to think that it was actually Amir al muminin that was responsible for the death of Uthman, which is a big lie. Amir al muminin had nothing to do with that. Nothing. But he made it seem like that, including having people come and swear to God in the presence of this companion that they saw something along those lines in Medina. They made this guy believe that it's actually Amir al Mu'manin. It's wrong, very wrong. But this person, had he known the truth, it wasn't like he had this hatred initially about or against Amir al Mu'manin. They didn't. The people who came with Muawiyah to Safin to fight Amir al muminin they came thinking that they're coming to serve the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something that you hear today as well. They say, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. They start shooting these people. Women, children, they just kill them. You think they're faking it? No. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these ignorant people have been taught that except for the evil, extremely evil ones, but there are actually some people that really think that they're doing service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They think they're going to be having lunch or dinner with the Holy Prophet in paradise once they kill a few Shias. That's what they're taught. 
You don't want to accept this explanation? Well, look at what Amir al-Mu'maneen does. Amir al-Mu'maneen in the Battle of Safin spent a lot of time explaining and addressing the followers or those who've come from Sham to Safin with Muawiyah, trying to explain to them and correct their understanding and show them that it's actually Muawiyah that is wrong, not Amir al-Mu'maneen. And he's able to bring people on his side. Many people that had come with Muawiyah from Sham to Safin to fight Amir al-Mu'mineen realized the truth. They turned against Muawiyah and they started fighting Muawiyah with Amir al-Mu'mineen. They misunderstood. This is very important. You know why it's really important? To understand that example because our circumstances, brothers and sisters living out here, is very, very similar to the circumstances of the people of Sham. Why? Because Muawiyah at the time, this Mal'oon, was very, very good at his propaganda. Okay? Trickery. It's famous, you've heard, that they did the Jum'ah prayer for Muslims and believers on a Wednesday in Sham. He raised the people with his lies, with the evil abilities that he had. He made people feel like, oh, this is right. Okay. He portrayed batil as haq in the best way possible. So he was able to portray to the people who loved the Holy Prophet, those of them who actually did love the Holy Prophet, he told them that this is the enemy of the Holy Prophet. They took it from him. Today what's happening out here is very similar. They use the same tricks. The people of Sham thought this companion of the Holy Prophet is a very good man. If he says Ali is responsible for this death, then he must be. If you get five of the companions of the Holy Prophet to say this man is responsible, it's difficult to say no to that. For us, it's difficult to understand the circumstances then. Because we think, oh, the heck with these companions of the Holy Prophet. They're all bad people. Why? Because we already know Ali ibn Abi Talib is ma'al haq wa aliyun ma'al Excuse me, you said a salawat, please. Amir al Mu'mineen is ma'al haq wal haqqu ma'a Ali yaduru haythu dar. We've come to that understanding. We already know whatever Ali ibn Abi Talib says is right. But today, out here, it's not as clear. They'll bring someone that you and I would respect, and they would portray some batil, something that is not true as haqq and we will take it. We are taught that certain people are our enemies where in fact they're not the enemies. The enemies are actually trying to make us think that these guys are the enemies so that they can just watch us fight each other and they'll be laughing their heads off enjoying themselves. That's why it's very important. On the other hand, the followers of Amir al in that same battle of Safin had the reverse problem. When things got difficult, Muawiyah was losing the battle. You all know the story. They put Qur'ans up on the spears and they said, look, we're all Muslims. Why are you guys fighting us? And now at this point, they turn their swords against Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi, and they say, you better stop this. Call Malik al-Ashtar back. These guys are Muslim. We shouldn't have even come here in the first place. Let's all pack up and go. Not able to understand who is the enemy and who is not. At what time you need to fight, when you need to stop. This is a historic problem. We have to understand the movement of Imam al Hussein in a more clear way we need to talk about some of the facts of the movement of Imam al-Hussein so we can take that 
home with us, think about it, and try to see how that translates today. Okay. We've got to try to do that. And this is what we want to do. But in order to understand the movement of Imam al Hussein, you know what? The mistake we make, I'll give you this. The mistake we make. The mistake we make when we want to try to understand and we want to try to read about Abu Abdullah al Hussein, we usually take certain passages of the movement of Imam al Hussein. What you'll find most on the topic of the movement of Imam al Hussein, the objective of the literature is to portray the cruelties. The objective of it is to bring tears to people's eyes, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But the problem with it is that it's very partial. It doesn't give you a clear picture. These books start with the death of the Mal'un Yazid. Okay. That's what they start with. Say he died, a letter was sent to Medina, the governor of Medina, Walid ibn Utbah called Marwan over. Imam al Hussein was in the masjid. The letter said, Call Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhim as salatu was salam to yourself and tell them they're either going to pledge allegiance or they're going to lose their head. Him and Abdullah ibn Zubair. Imam al Hussein went and the rest of the story. That's where they began pretty much. And then they talk about the movement of the Imam from Medina to Mecca and then from there to Kufa and the focus of it is to try to explain how nobody joined the Imam how the Imam spoke of this movement and he has to go there and it's going to lead to Shahada and then the end of the story is what happens the cruelties and the brutalities in Karbala that's good but it's not enough it's not enough you know how we can understand better what the Imam was trying to do we have to start with the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Briefly, of course, I'll leave the rest of it to you. I want to draw sort of a timeline of what happens, what the Holy Prophet does. He sets the standards. We got to understand this. The Holy Prophet, according to the Ahlul Bayt, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi the Holy Prophet is the one that sets the standards. Okay. He tells us what the objective is. Whether it's the verses of the Holy Quran or the words of the Holy Prophet or the conduct, the behavior, what he did socially and politically as well as the other arenas of life. He sets that standard and then we realize okay, this is the direction. This is what we need to move towards. The Ahlul Bayt, Salamullah alayhim ajma'in, are the continuation of that. Okay. They continue the line of the Holy Prophet. That's why it's very important to understand, briefly at least, touching upon a few points in the timeline, in the sequence of events, what happened during the time of the Holy Prophet, focusing on some of the strategies and also the friends and the enemies of the Holy Prophet insha'Allah. But it seems like the time has passed the amount that I have had. And so we'll start the history of the Holy Prophet and we'll try to be as brief as possible from tomorrow night and then we'll move from there to Amir al-Mu'maneen, Imam al-Mujtaba and Imam al-Hussein salamullah alayhim ajma'een. It is the first night of Muharram. Let's all try to take our hearts to Karbala and ask Imam al Hussein Salamullah alayhi on this first night. We want to ask Abu Abdullah al Hussein firstly by the right of his mother, Salamullah alayha. The Lady Fatima to Zahra, that he grant us tears. We want to be able to shed tears for Abu Abdullah al Hussein on these nights. 
We ask him, we seek the intercession of his mother, the lady Fatima to Zahra, Salamullah alayha, that if our hearts have hardened because of the sins that I myself, I can say for myself, have committed, we know that if you raise your hands, Ya Fatima to Zahra, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will forgive. We ask you, please, on this night, we seek your intercession. As-salamu alaykum Ya Aba Abdullah As-salamu يا أهل بيت النبوة وموضع الرسالة ومختلف الملائكة ومهبط الواح ومعدن الرحمة وخزان العلم ومنتهى الخير May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you, my beloved Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you, it was in your homes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with guidance and revelation. Upon you descend angels day in and day out. Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Sallallahu alayka ya mazloom Sallallahu alayka ayyuha al-shaheed bikarbala atshalam May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. My beloved Imam al Hussain, My beloved oppressed Imam. The Imam that was slaughtered by the shores of the Euphrates while his mouth was dry of thirst. Sallallahu alayhi It is custom in certain regions that on the first night of the majalis for Abu Abdullah al Hussein, we remember the first of the shuhada, the one who left this world before the Imam even arrived in Karbala, the cousin of the Imam, Muslim ibn Aqil. As-salamu alayk, ya Muslim. We testify that you Muslim did what you could, whatever was in your capacity, to help Imam al Hussain. Imagine Muslim. 
There were moments in Kufa. He was sent by Imam al Hussein to see if the people who would send these letters were truthful and loyal. Muslim came. He spoke to the people. They came group after group. They gathered 18,000 people, pledged allegiance to Muslim. Muslim sent the letter to Imam al Hussein. Ya Aba Abdullah, I testify these people are loyal. They have come, 18,000 people have pledged allegiance. Come to Kufa, they're awaiting your lead. But time goes by after the letter is sent. Imam al Hussein gradually makes his move from Mecca towards Kufa. Ubaidullah bin Ziyad comes to Kufa. Gradually, people start to leave Muslim. He threatens some, bribes other heads of tribes. People start to leave Muslim ibn Aqil. Imagine Muslim, the last night that he had a following in the Masjid of Kufa. He has many lines formed behind him performing the prayer. But eventually, they start leaving one by one, group after group. When Muslim turns around after he says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, only a few people remain with the Muslim. Imagine this lonely crowd leaving the masjid. A Muslim is walking in the streets of Kufa, lonely at night. What it reminds me of is Amir al walking all lonely in the streets of Kufa, taking bread and goods to the families of the poor but instead of them thanking Ali ibn Abi Talib they curse Ali maybe Muslim is having these thoughts in his mind he ends up at the door of the lady you know the story she asks him what are you doing here at this time of night Oh stranger, have you no place to stay? He says, who would let Muslims stay at their house? I am a stranger, I have no place. I am the representative of Hussein ibn Ali. The lady has respect and love for Amir al Mu'minin and his children he lets her, she lets him in but unfortunately her son comes late he realizes there's someone in the house he realizes it's Muslim ibn Aqil. He calls the authorities in. They come, they ambush him. From all directions, this warrior of Banu Hashim, fighting from all directions, but also from rooftops. They say the enemy was throwing stones, maybe arrows. Eventually he gets wounded all over and they take him to the castle before Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Imagine the scene. Imagine the scene. They say Muslim at that point asked for a bit of water. 
But brothers and sisters, there's something about the story of Karbala. All of the shuhada of Karbala have to leave this world with a thirsty mouth. They say Muslim takes, tries to take a drink of the water. His lips are bleeding, the water becomes najis, he pours it out, another cup. The same thing happens, they realize this is how we have to meet our Lord. They take him over Darul Imara on the roof before they behead the Muslim. He turns towards Mecca. Imagine what's going on in the heart of a Muslim. Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. I wish I had someone to tell you turn back, don't come to Kufa. The people here are not loyal. News arrived to the camp of Imam al Hussein when he had already started his course towards Kufa. They say when Imam al Hussein heard the news of Muslim being martyred, he called for the daughter of a Muslim. He brought her over, he sat her on his lap, he started to stroke her head. They say, or maybe she thought to herself, Oh, uncle, you've never sat me like this before. You've never stroked my hair like this before. Usually orphans are stroked like this. We say, Ya Aba Abdullah. If you sat the daughter of Muslim down after his shahada and stroked her hair, you know what they did to your daughters after you left this world? Instead of stroking the hair of your daughters, they pulled their scarves off. They ripped their earrings out of their ears. <laughs> وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون